Squeezed in between four of the Great Lakes is the state of Michigan, a state that is home to over 10 million people and comprised of two separate peninsulas. But despite having so much access to fresh water, over 80% of all Michiganders live south of this line. So why do so few people in Michigan live in the north? And why does Michigan even own the Upper Peninsula in the first place? Welcome to Geography by Jeff. Today we're heading back to the Great Lakes region of the United States. But this time, we're going to take a magnifying lens to the state of Michigan to find out why most of its population lives in the southern part of the state. Because of course, there's a geographic reason for this. But first, because you're interested in the state of Michigan, be sure to check out this podcast episode on the U.S. automobile industry. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, all based in Detroit, Michigan, have changed the United States in some pretty surprising ways. And you can learn all about it right after this video. Simply click this link or check out the description below. Michigan, also known as the Great Lakes State, has a history that is far deeper than many might expect, given that it's a relatively new state within the United States. In fact, Michigan wasn't admitted into the country until well after its neighbors such as Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois all became states themselves. And of course, the state's history goes back even further with many of the indigenous tribes of the region. The Native American tribes of Michigan, such as the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi tribes, occupied the region long before European explorers arrived. Their livelihoods centered around fishing, hunting, and trading, and they lived in semi-nomadic communities, adapting to the harsh Midwestern winters and the lush summers. And while these three tribes were dominant within the area we know today as the state of Michigan, they were also part of a larger linguistic group of indigenous peoples known as the Anishinaabe, which would encompass not only Michigan, but really the entire Great Lakes region of the continent. Of course, while the tribes ruled the land for a millennia, a slow but steady push by European settlers would upend their lives entirely. The first Europeans to set foot in Michigan were French explorers in the early 1600s. Fur trading posts and missions were established, notably at Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac Island. With the advent of European settlement, came significant upheaval for the indigenous tribes, including the loss of lands and the introduction of diseases like smallpox, which decimated their populations. France would control Michigan until 1763, when it was ceded to the British following the French and Indian War. During the American Revolutionary War, Michigan was a strategic territory, and its control oscillated between the British and the Americans. Finally, the region came under American control after the signing of the Treaty of Paris of 1783 although British troops did not completely vacate the area until after the War of 1812. This would formalize the region as being part of the United States' large collection of wild territories. As part of the Northwest Territory, Michigan began to see an influx of American settlers, encouraged by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. However, it wasn't until after the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 that the population truly began to boom. The canal provided an accessible water route from the East Coast to the Great Lakes, making it easier for people to migrate to Michigan. The 1830s were a critical decade for Michigan's path to statehood. The Michigan Territory applied for statehood in 1835, sparking a border dispute with Ohio over the Toledo Strip. Known as the Toledo War, this conflict was mostly bloodless, but politically significant. Ultimately, the US Congress intervened, granting the contested Toledo Strip to Ohio and compensating Michigan with what is now the Upper Peninsula. This compromise paved the way for Michigan to be admitted to the Union as the 26th state on January 26, 1837. Michigan's early economy was based on its natural resources such as lumber, minerals, and fur, but it later became a powerhouse of manufacturing with the rise of the automobile industry in the early 1900s. A legacy it still holds today as being home to the three largest American auto manufacturers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Michigan has a complicated history that spans multiple Native American tribes, two European countries, and even internal strife within the United States. And all of this history is directly linked to the state's fascinating geography as a couple of large peninsulas. But before we get to Michigan's geography, if you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button. More fun geography videos are just a single click away. Michigan is geographically unique in many ways, largely owing to its proximity to four of the five Great Lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie. The state is divided into two main landmasses, the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula, which are connected by the Mackinac Bridge, 
one of the longest suspension bridges in the world at just over four miles in length. The Upper Peninsula is a unique region of the state. For one, it's the largest portion of land owned by any state that is not directly connected to it. All told, the Upper Peninsula makes up approximately one-third of Michigan's total land area. And within the Upper Peninsula is a vast amount of wilderness that's rich in mineral resources like iron and copper, which spurred a mining industry in the mid-1800s. Today, the Upper Peninsula is less populated than the Lower Peninsula, and as such, retains its untouched wilderness feeling. In contrast, the Lower Peninsula is more varied in its urban geography, but is generally flatter overall. It's home to Michigan's largest city, Detroit, located in the southeast near the border with Canada. The region features a mix of fertile farmlands, forests, and urban centers. One of the most striking geographic features is the extensive coastline along the Great Lakes, which totals more than 3,000 miles. This makes Michigan the state with the ninth largest coastline overall, and the most amount of freshwater coastline than any other U.S. state, a geography that has an incredible impact on Michigan's weather. But while the state is mostly comprised of two main peninsulas that are fairly close to each other, its climate can vary significantly between the two of them. Generally, the entire state is characterized as a humid continental climate, with cold winters and warm summers. However, the Great Lakes moderate the climate to some extent, making the winters slightly milder and the summers cooler than other states at the same latitude. Lake effect snow is also a common phenomenon, particularly in areas close to the lakes, leading to heavy snowfall in winter. Furthermore, Michigan's geography has played a significant role in its human history and economic development. The abundance of natural resources like timber and minerals fueled its early economy, while the extensive waterways facilitated trade and transportation. In the 20th century, the flat landscapes of the Lower Peninsula became hubs for manufacturing and industry, paving its way to become one of the country's most prosperous states by the middle of the 1900s. But while Michigan boomed in the early and mid-1900s, its growth and development would not be shared equally across the region. The Upper Peninsula and the northern part of the Lower Peninsula would never quite grow in the same way that the far southern region would. The stark contrast in population density between the northern and southern regions of Michigan is very interesting to study. All told, the southern region of Michigan is home to about 80% of all Michiganders, while the northern region is home to just about 20%. The Upper Peninsula, part of the northern region, is home to just 3% of Michigan's total population of about 10 million people. One of the most significant factors influencing this population disparity is economic opportunity. The southern part of Michigan is an industrial hub, with Detroit famously serving as the epicenter of America's automotive industry. This has historically drawn a large workforce to the area, leading to urbanization and population growth. In contrast, the northern regions have a limited economic base, often revolving around natural resources like timber and mining, sectors that have seen decline over the years. While tourism is a significant contributor to the economy in the north, it offers primarily seasonal employment, which is not enough to sustain large populations year-round. But the physical geography also plays a pivotal role. The rugged terrain and harsher climate of the northern regions, especially the Upper Peninsula, make it less hospitable for large-scale agriculture and settlement. The absence of major highways and limited public transportation options further contribute to its isolation. On the other hand, the southern half enjoys a more moderate climate and flatter landscapes, conducive for agriculture and urban development. And of course, access to essential services is another factor contributing to the population disparity. The southern regions are physically closer to other population centers such as Chicago, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and even Toronto, Canada. And this means that trade and travel are far easier for the southern part of the state. In contrast, residents in the northern regions often have to travel considerable distances to access similar urban amenities, making it less appealing for most people. All told, the southern region of Michigan is home to over 80% of the population, or a little more than 8 million people. This would be led by the overwhelmingly dominant Detroit metro region, with about 4.4 million people. Other major metro areas in the south would be Grand Rapids with about 1 million people, Lansing with about 550,000 people, Flint with 405,000, Ann Arbor with 367,000, and Kalamazoo with 265,000 people. By contrast, the northern region has far smaller urban areas. Saginaw would be the largest metro region in the north with about 190,000 people. This would be followed by Traverse City even farther north with about 153,000 people. Marquette takes the crown as the largest city in the Upper Peninsula with 67,000 people in its entire metro region. But while the Upper Peninsula makes up Michigan's least populated region overall, 
It almost became part of the state of Wisconsin, were it not for a brewing conflict over Ohio's Toledo Strip. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan is geographically closer to Wisconsin, yet politically and administratively it belongs to Michigan. The story behind this arrangement dates back to the early 1800s and involves political wrangling, resource allocation, and a small yet significant conflict known as the Toledo War. In 1835, both the Michigan Territory and the state of Ohio claimed a strip of land known as the Toledo Strip. This area, around the mouth of the Maumee River, was seen as valuable due to its proximity to Lake Erie, which offered the promise of a thriving port city. The Toledo War was a mostly bloodless dispute involving militias, saber-rattling, and political posturing, but it posed a significant problem for the U.S. Congress. Michigan could not be admitted to the Union as a state while it had an unresolved territorial conflict with another state. Congress intervened and brokered a compromise. Ohio would retain the Toledo Strip, but Michigan would be compensated with a large portion of land, what is now known as the Upper Peninsula, taken from the Wisconsin Territory. At the time, many viewed this as a poor deal for Michigan. The Upper Peninsula was seen as a remote, resource-poor wilderness far removed from Michigan's population centers in the Lower Peninsula. However, the deal turned out to be unexpectedly favorable for Michigan. Shortly after the agreement, rich deposits of iron and copper were discovered in the Upper Peninsula. These mineral resources proved to be extremely valuable, transforming the area into an economic powerhouse during the late 1800s. The mining boom attracted settlers and investment, and while the Upper Peninsula never became densely populated, it became a vital part of Michigan's economy and identity. Had the Toledo War not happened, or had the Congressional Compromise favored a different outcome, the Upper Peninsula might well have become part of Wisconsin. Geographically, this would make sense, as the Upper Peninsula is connected to Wisconsin by land, but historical events unfolded in such a way that the area was awarded to Michigan instead, and this has had lasting impacts on the state's economic and cultural landscape. Michigan is a unique state that is comprised of two pretty large peninsulas that's surrounded by fresh water. This has enabled it to grow a huge industry and population over the decades. But as we see with most states, much of that population is located where it's most geographically convenient for trade. And in this case, that means the far south and not the north. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Michigan's population distribution and why it owns the Upper Peninsula in the first place. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. If you want to listen to the podcast episode, you can click this link. And if you want to watch another of my videos, you can click here. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.